Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're going to be doing another Top 5 video. Uh, I don't do a ton of these, I usually do three or four of these a year, um, but uh, another video that's probably a month late, but I did want to get it out there because there's a lot of games that are supposed to be coming out this year that I'm really excited about, and I want to kind of talk about some of them. We've done some of these videos in like, this game was announced or whatever, so we've talked a little about some of these but we know more about some of these games and some of the other ones I haven't even talked about yet. So I wanted to talk about my top five most anticipated strategy games of 2022. There's going to be a follow on video that's going to be launching in the next couple of days. That's going to be my top five war games of 2022. Um, now, just sort of an FYI, a couple of the strategy games could be could be titled war games. I tried to make some delineation where things are a little more puzzly and more strategy focused versus war games. Um, and the war game list also is kind of a war game flight sim sort of, you know, games about war type combination. So the, the definitions are a little bit loose. And really, frankly, it's up to my discretion because it's my video and it's my opinions. So feel free to disagree with it. Um, but that's just sort of laying things out there. With that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at my top five upcoming strategy games for 2022. At number five, Regiments, developed by Bird's Eye Games and published by Microprose Software. Regiments is a real-time strategy game, and it's on this list even though it could kind of be classified as a war game uh, because of its real-time elements. This is a game that is set in Germany in 1989. Uh, it is basically a World War III game, assuming that the Cold War went hot. And it's a game that puts you in charge, uh, seemingly, of an individual regiment of soldiers uh, during the Third World War as this war breaks out. And you take your regiment and you fight it through a series of battles in a somewhat dynamic campaign. Uh, in kind of a war game uh, style, what I mean by war game, I mean like war game, air land battle, war game, red dragon, uh, the Eugen games. So it is, it's a game that's about taking different points on the map, destroying the enemy, managing your own deck or your set of units to try and minimize casualties and carry those units from one battle to another. Uh, you can customize your forces and, and sort of make changes to uh, your your deck, if you will, to um, kind of figure out what the right force composition is. Uh, the game obviously occurs in the late Cold War, so you're going to have a lot of smart weapons, missiles, uh, you know, aircraft doing close air support, um, anti-tank missiles. You're going to have, you know, a wide array of vehicles, you know, Leopards, T-72s, M1 Abrams, those kind of things. Uh, the game claims it's a got a smooth learning curve. I've played it a little bit in some of its demo and preview versions, and uh, it's an interesting game, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. You know, I think one thing that stands out about this game is that the War Game series by Eugen, which is obviously a different series of games, but, you know, is similar to this, tends to lean pretty heavily into multiplayer. They do have uh, some single-player elements. I I'm not a huge fan of, of some of their latest work, um, but this game doesn't seem to have multiplayer. It is just a single player game. And so presumably it's going to be leading, leaning into that sort of narrative of like, you're the commander of an individual regiment. World War III is erupting around you. There's all these smart munitions, there's aircraft, all these other things that are hitting you hard. And you've got to sort of win your battles, but, you know, also continue to carry your task force forward uh, if the game works the way that I think it will. Um, and so this is, I think, going to be an interesting Cold War Gone Hot game. Uh, it does have game modes other than the campaign. It's going to have a skirmish mode um, as well. And um, so you can just kind of pick up and play. Uh, but I think the big thing that's interesting is that it's lacking a multiplayer element. It's just going to be single player. And so that's, I think, going to give a different focus to this game than, than what we've seen in similar games in the past. Uh, it does say that there's four factions, the Soviet Union, USA, West Germany, and East Germany. I'm assuming they're all playable, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, and uh, so far, I'm pretty impressed with it. It is being published by the, you know, re resurgent Microprose. And uh, I guess, you know, we'll see what comes of it. But I love the idea of a real-time tactical game, late Cold War, that really focuses in on the single-player experience and also trying to sort of carry my, my units forward um, through, you know, a dynamically evolving battlefield and uh, seeing how we can, you know, 
keep my troops alive while also accomplishing the objective. Uh, Cause I think one of the things that like the stereotype of any of the, the cold war gone hot scenarios is that those forward units are going to get attrited so darn fast that they're going to be ground down to, you know, just a nub in a couple of days. So I'm curious to see how they, how they handle that. The game originally was slated to come out last year. Uh, they did push the game back to uh, 2022. So presumably it's going to be coming out before too long. If you are interested, there is a play test. You can go, I believe to the steam page for regiments. Um, there's a, I'll put a link in the description to the game. And if you go there, uh, you can test play like some of the operations uh, that are in the game. So that's, you know, all I really have to say about it. Uh, I think it's an interesting real-time tactical strategy game, and I'm excited about it, and I'm curious to see uh, what uh, what comes of it. But that's what we have at number five. It is Regiments, published by Microprose uh, and developed by Bird's Eye Games. Moving on to number four. At number four is Panzer Corps II Pacific. Now, I debated putting this game on the list at all because it is technically a downloadable content, and if I was to expand that list, I probably should include, you know, Crusader Kings 3's uh, Royal Courts, but it feels almost like a game in of itself based on what I've seen here, so I did decide to include it. It could go in the war game list, but again, it is, uh, in my opinion, the Panzer Corps games tend to be a little bit more puzzly, a little more, a bit more strategic, um, and less simulation and less war game, and so that's why it's on this list. Um, the developer is Flashback Games. The publisher is Slytherin, and this is a game that takes the Panzer Corps II series and moves it to the Pacific Theater of Operations. That's particularly interesting to me because the Panzer Corps series, which are these sort of turn-based war games, sort of a, a little bit more detailed than a beer and pretzel war game, but they're pretty entry-level war games, has always really leaned heavily into the European theater. Uh, the Panzer Corps series is sort of a spiritual successor to the old SSI games of I want to say the 90s and early 2000s, the Panzer General series, uh, which were very similar in concept and execution. And while there was a Pacific General, which looked at the Pacific Theater of Operations, none of the Panzer General games ever really did that. Uh, Panzer Corps has never looked at the Pacific. And so you're going to be taking this turn-based sort of higher level, a little bit abstract, uh, puzzly kind of war game and bring it to the Pacific Theater of Operations. So instead of invading wide you know, swaths of Russia or Poland or France, you're now going to be dealing with a lot of island operations. Some of the scenarios that they've said that are going to be in this include battles for Wake Island, uh, the Philippines, Bataan, uh, the Coral Sea, Midway, New Guinea. And so like when you look at Coral Sea and Midway, those are very clearly naval battles, which was always kind of a minor portion of the Panzer Corps series. Like they had naval operations for Sea Lion. They had the, the invasion of Norway, which included naval assets and some of the North Africa battles. But it was always a very minor part to this game. And I think one of the things that this series really has always struggled on is getting naval combat right. That's because the way these games work is units have sort of a hit point strength of, you know, like 10 or 15 or a base of 20. And then when they engage with enemy units, they'll take three or four or five or maybe more of damage. I don't think that very, very accurately represents naval combat. It might represent two infantry divisions slugging it out and grinding each other down, but it doesn't really represent sort of the, the quick hit pace of naval combat. And I'm really curious to see. I mean, the game says that it's going to be completely revamping naval combat. What does that mean? I haven't seen that yet, but I'm curious to see it. Um, you know, I'm curious if they're moving to the Pacific Theater because Order of Battle, which was a similar turn-based war game series, started in the Pacific at the same time that like Panzer Corps One came out or a little bit after. And so Order of Battle is kind of wrapped up, uh, I believe, all of their DLC. Maybe they have a little bit still going on, but they moved to Europe. And so this, this turn-based game that's made by Slytherin has not, you know, they don't have a Pacific variant of it that's been doing anything in the Pacific for a while. So maybe that's why they're moving into the Pacific. Um, but I think one of the things I really liked about Order of Battle is they kind of did some of the naval stuff a little bit differently. I don't think it was great at reflecting naval combat, but they had the idea of planes taking off and landing, which Panzer Corps has. Um, they did have some aspects of carrier management of air wings, 
which I think was interesting. Fuel limitations and other things like that. They had some supply line mechanics that were unique from the previous versions of Panzer Core. And so really, I'm just curious to see how Panzer Core approaches this and how they really, um, you know, bring this bring this to light. Because I don't think the turn-based mode uh, for this type of game that is very abstract and, and kind of uh, simple necessarily plays well for naval combat. And I don't think the Panzer Corps series has done naval combat terribly well in the past, but who knows with this rework. The game will have a playable campaign from both the Japanese and the Allied perspective. Uh, they're claiming it's the largest DLC to date. Um, if you look at, at the game here, it looks like it's going to cover 1941 to 43. So I'm assuming there will be a 44 to 45 DLC that comes on down the line after that. Um, they've got the Battles of Wake Island, the Philippines in 41, Bataan, Raids, La Salamua, uh, Coral Sea, Midway, New Guinea, Guadalcanal, New, Naval Guadalcanal, New Georgia, Bougainville, uh, Rabaul, and Tarawa. So really those 40 to 41 to 43 battles, early 43 really. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what comes after that. But that's a reasonable list of scenarios. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of excited. I want to I know what they've d changed or done with naval combat to make it feel right. That's really a lot of rambling, kind of repetitive. So I think it's time to move on uh, to number three. At number three is a game I'm projecting will come out this year, but I'm not super convinced that it will. Um, but I did want to talk about it because it wasn't on the list last year because we didn't know about it. Um, the third game on this list is a game called Arms Trade Tycoon. Uh, which I guess technically their Steam page is saying Q2 of 2023, but that seems a really far way out, especially with as far along as the demo is. They just concluded a Kickstarter. They're starting a Patreon, which is weird because they announced they're being published by Microprose. Then they announced a Kickstarter, which got what they wanted. And now they're announcing a Patreon, which feels like a lot of asking for money when you have a publisher. Like, if you have a real publisher, the publisher is supposed to fund your development. Like, one of the major perks of having a publisher is that they write you a check to help your development. Now, I don't know the detail of the developer's agreement with Microprose for Arms Trade Tycoon Tanks. Maybe they didn't want to give up as much of the sales to Microprose, and so there's some sort of special agreement there where they take less money from Microprose and they raise some money on their own. Maybe... Still a little bit weird, just being totally transparent about that. But this is a really interesting game. It's being developed by Fun Guy. That's the name of the studio. It's being published, as I said, by Microprose. And it is a business management game, um, sort of the classic, you know, sim or tycoon type game of, of the strategy genre that used to be really popular in the 90s and early 2000s, except for the first time in this genre's history that I can remember it's going to be looking at the development of armored units. So you are basically a business magnet and you are running a tank factory. And so your job is to design tanks, which means you need to do research and development on their different technology. Um, you need to do research and development on guns, on engines, on hulls, on armor, on, you know, whatever you could think when it comes to armored warfare. And then you can, you know, once you research it, then you can put it into a design and you can put it into a prototype and you can test the prototype on the battlefield, um, see how the prototype performs. And then when your country uh, actually asks, you know, for tank designs, you can submit your designs to that and try and win the contract. So you can be you know, like Lockheed Martin bidding on the F-35, except in this case, you're bidding on tank designs. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting concept, right? You've got to manage your supply chain. You've got to manage bringing enough, enough, you know, high carbon steel, medium carbon steel, rubber, iron, you know, whatever would go into making the stuff that's in a tank. You got to bring that all into your factory. It takes time when you order that stuff for it to be shipped to you. You've got to manage, you know, hey, if the government's saying we want 100 of these tanks and you win the contract, they're going to tell you we need those tanks by a certain date. And you got to meet that. So if you're not ready, if you aren't staffed up, if you don't have your assembly lines running, if you don't have your materials ready or on the way, you might not be able to meet that contract. If you meet the contract, your reputation goes up. If you fail to meet the contract, your reputation goes down. If you continue to fail to meet the contract, maybe you have trouble bidding on lucrative contracts in the future. 
You set up assembly lines in your factories to get those production lines running. You have to manage shipping the equipment out to the actual, you know, government to get the tanks to them. And then when all of that's said and done, uh, you get to kind of see in a, and not, you don't really fight it, but you get to kind of see the output of the results. You get reports back from the battlefield saying how your tank's performing and then it gives you information. And if your tanks perform well, well, then your reputation goes up. And if your tanks perform poorly, then your reputation may go down. And again, reputation is going to influence your ability to win future contracts. And so it's a really compelling game, in my opinion. But, uh, you know, I always wanted to make a game about this, except like aviation instead of tanks. But it's a really compelling game, I think, from a business management perspective. You're managing a, a military industrial complex, you know, company. And uh, I don't know that I've ever seen that done before. There's a couple of games like Sprocket that lean into tank design. Uh, there's this one game that I forgot the name of where you're basically running a factory that's producing war materials and you've got to make money. But like this is the only one that I've really seen that kind of is leaning into the idea of like the you are you know, the, the producer of the tire tank, you are the producer of, you know, the Churchill or the Sherman, you know, you're Ford, you're Krupp, you're whatever. And I think it's an awesome concept. I played the demo. I really like the demo. The demo takes place in world war one, the early days of world war one. Um, they're saying the final version is going to cover from world war one to the modern era, which seems absurdly long given how slow the world war one period is. I could see them pulling that in a bit, um, but we'll see. I'm really excited about the game. A little bit uncomfortable about some of these, like we're doing a Kickstarter, we're doing a Patreon, we're also having a publisher, like that all feels weird to me. Um, certainly not typical for the video game space. Maybe it's more typical in the board game space, I've been told. Uh, but overall, it's a game that I'm definitely going to be paying attention to. I'm really excited for. I hope it comes out this year, but maybe it's not until next year. I have a really bad tendency with these lists to talk about games that I'm excited about for this year, and then they don't come out to the following year or two years later. So we'll see. Uh, but with that being said, Arms Trade Tycoon Tanks, uh, being developed by Fun Guy and being published by, by Microprose, is my number three most anticipated strategy game of 2022. So moving on to number two. At number two of my most anticipated strategy games of 2022 is a game called Superpower 3 being developed by Gollum Labs and published by THQ Nordic. Now I had a lot to say about Arms Trade Tycoon Tanks because I've played the demo and it seems like we know a lot about what the game may look like. I don't know if we have as much to say about Superpower 3. But that doesn't mean I'm not even more excited about this game. And that's because this is a series that I've played, oh, going back 20 plus years. I, I'm not sure exactly when Superpower 1 came out, but when it came out, I played it a ton. When Superpower 2 came out, I played it a little bit less, but it was still a game that was really fun and uh, I enjoyed playing a lot. Superpower is basically a series of games uh, where you are the ruler of an individual country. So in this game, it's saying that you have... 190 some odd countries to choose from 194 I believe specifically and basically you're the ruler of that country in a modern geopolitical setting so modern days you're in charge of this country and obviously your objective is to you know make your country more powerful uh, and to potentially you know take over the world although it's not necessarily that's the only strategy you you, you go with um but this is a series that kind of mixes, at least historically in the past, Superpower 2 leaned very heavily into sort of this cartoony vibe. Superpower 1 was a little bit more serious. Based on the handful of screenshots that we've seen here, it seems like it might be leaning more into the more serious side, but we really only have a few screenshots. But I guess, you know, long-winded way of saying, I think one of the things that's really interesting is we don't have a lot of games that look at sort of modern geopol geopolitics from a strategy perspective. Paradox does a great job on the historical side, you know, whether it's Victoria or, um, you know, Hearts of Iron or e Europa Universalis or Crusader Kings. They do a really good job of looking at games um, in the past. Not anything post-Civil, not anything post-World War II, though. Like, they had a East versus West Cold War game, um, but that never got published. Um, there are a couple of other series uh, that do uh, look at modern politics. There's the Realpolitik series uh, by Juju B, uh, which is 
uh, an interesting geopolitical simulator, again, of kind of modern times. Um, it's published by 1C Entertainment, if you're interested in checking that out. Uh, it's kind of a similar concept um, as these games. And then you have the geopolitical uh, simulator games, which are like a series of games, which from my understanding have always been really buggy. They've always been kind of mixed reviews, if you will, um, just sort of rehashed versions of the same game year after year. And like, if you look at the reviews on steam, it's always kind of very, very mixed, but they have like a new one coming out every year. Um, that kind of is topical and looks at like what's going on in the world in this given year. Um, and it's made by a developer called Eversim. Uh, but Superpower Three is is being published by THQ Nordic, which of the th- of these other games is kind of the biggest publisher of of um, strategy game. Well, I haven't really strategy games, but kind of the biggest name of any of the the publishers that have worked on these previous types of games. And again, we don't have a lot of options to choose from. There's also sort of the Supreme Ruler series, but they tend to delve more into the historical stuff. There is some near future stuff. Um, which I know like Tortuga Power is a big fan of the of the Supreme Ruler series. Those are much more, I believe, military focused. So I'm curious to see what we get from Super Power 3. Again, we don't know a ton about it. Uh, we know that 194 different nations are playable. We know that you can customize your ruler. Uh, we know that um, it is set in the modern era. Um, you can use, you know, your, your military or other things like that, sort of a, a managerial and strategic game. Uh, to try and, uh, you know, increase your global dominance, if you will. Um, And overall, I guess it's just curious to see what comes of this. I think one of the really big games that I enjoyed a long time ago was called Shadow President. And that was a game that was really detailed. Um, You know, you didn't, you can just go around it invading everybody because it would get the rest of the world pissed off at you. Um, And it was set in the early 90s. and, And I really am striving for something that lets me feel like I am a leader of a country in the modern world and that it's not just like go paint the map your color, right? Like I want, I want a geopolitical simulator that lets me mimic trade, uh, you know, wars and an effort to overthrow your, your opponent uh, via influence, via military buildup that doesn't necessarily result in conflict. The need to use your military in a way that you can influence other countries without conflict um, or potentially sort of a spiraling escalation uh, crisis that kind of gets out of control and maybe you accidentally stumble into conflict. Uh, but I really would like to see the Superpower series revived. We're going to see that. I've enjoyed the original ones. I think Superpower 1 did a really good job of kind of being serious, but also giving you a lot of customization options around designing new equipment, uh, managing relations, and in some t- cases invading other countries. Uh, using nuclear weapons is, is fun in these kind of games. But yeah, I guess I'm just I'm pumped to see this series sort of renewed, and I'm curious to see what comes of it. With that being said, before we jump into my number one most anticipated game of 2022 on the strategy side, I did want to talk about an honorable mention, and that's because this game was on my list last year, uh, but it is definitely on my list this year, and it would probably be number one on my list this year if I didn't put it on the list last year. And this is a game which you'll probably be seeing popping up on the channel very soon, Uh, And it is a game called Distant Worlds 2, being made by Code Force and published by Slytherin. This is, I guess you could say, kind of like Slytherin's take on Stellaris. So Stellaris being the Paradox Interactive game that looks at 4X space exploration and sort of building empires across galaxies. Uh, Distant Worlds 2 is the sequel to Distant Worlds 1, as you might guess. And it's a much more in-depth look at space exploration and expansion. Um, You know, you've got more than a handful of resources. Uh, One of the things that I think is really exciting about this game is sort of the uh, private economy that exists. So in short, you're the ruler or or I guess um, you're, you're involved in a space empire and you're looking at expanding throughout the galaxy and meeting with other civilizations or aliens and either having politics and diplomatic relations with them or maybe fighting against them. You have to manage things like research and development. You have to manage things like building your navies and fleets and expanding your capabilities. But what really sets this game apart is the ability to have things like a private economy kind of running itself, uh, the need to protect shipping lanes and things like that, Uh, the need to control investments or leave things alone. Uh, But really, it's just this ability to 
you know, turn things on, turn things off. It's highly customizable. Um, you know, I, I actually did a Distant Worlds 1 playthrough with, I think it was Das Tactic and, um, oh my God, I'm blanking uh, on, the, on the name of the other individual. Um, but uh, we did like, a, there was a long running role playing series where people were handing saves back and forth. It was kind of like the first succession series that I ever did. Um, and essentially the concept is like, you're the ruler of this empire of this, uh, in this galaxy, but the world lives and breathes around you in a way that it doesn't in most other space four X's, most other space four X's sort of, you're the driving force of everything. Um, they abstract a lot or they get you into the minutia, but you can't like turn things off. You can't ignore things. And in this, in this game, again, um, you are able to automate, uh, the game to sort of what you want to do with it. Um, you can focus on certain areas of the gameplay experience and turn off others. Uh, I know some people in like the original distant worlds would like focus on like one ship and just let the world go beyond them. Um, so it, you know, it's, it's a really interesting four X space strategy game that is massive in size and scope that is kind of a living and breathing world in and around you. And, uh, I need to dive into this more. I've got a preview kit. It comes out in March. Uh, but I'm really excited to see what comes of this. It really, based on what I've seen so far, seems like one of those games that Slytherin really stepped up on and kind of, I think, upped some of the, the production value behind some of this. I think the credit definitely goes to Code Force. Obviously, they're the developer. My understanding is it's like almost like a one-man shop, so it's really impressive to see a game like this uh, with such a small team. Um, but overall, I think it, it, you know, it may set the bar for Space 4X games moving forward. And there's a lot to be excited about and like about this. Um, it was on my list last year, so it's not technically on the list as anything more than an honorable mention this year, uh, but I'm really excited about it. And with that being said, that brings us to our number one most anticipated strategy game of 2022. And this shouldn't come as a shock, I don't think, uh, but that is going to be Victoria 3. I'm assuming it's coming out this year. They haven't announced a release date, but this is the newest uh, IP coming out by Paradox Development Studio, published by Paradox Interactive. It is the newest uh, iteration of the Victoria series, which takes place in the primarily the 18th and into the earliest 20th century. You're the ruler of individual countries in this age of imperialism uh, and everything that comes along with that. They've been releasing a lot of information in the dev diaries, so check that out if you're interested. Uh, the game seems to be leaning very heavily into the social and economic side of the game, which is an interesting strategy to take. I feel like in the previous Victoria games, uh, they definitely leaned a little bit more into military. Military seems like it's going to be a bit more abstract uh, in this particular sort of iteration of the series. Obviously, it's not completely void from the game because it is an era of imperialism. It is an era of empire building. It includes the race to Africa, if you will, if you're a European colonial country. Um, you know, it includes the American-Spanish and uh, American War. It includes, you know, generally it wraps up with the First World War. And so you've got this whole uh, global narrative, if you will, starting just in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars in the 1820s or 30s, and then leading you, it actually runs from 1836 to 1936, um, and so it's leading you from sort of a little bit after the Napoleonic era, really the industrialization outside of Britain. Everybody's just sort of industrializing for the first time in this era. And it leads you right up to the beginning of World War II. I don't know if it's going to link directly into Hearts of Iron. I don't think this kind of game would work very well to merge. But like they've done that in the past where CK and EU link together via via some patch. In theory, the end date of this being right on the verge of World War II could let them do that. But Hearts of Iron is such a military game and Victory is not. So I don't know if that would work very well. I mean, obviously, building your military up is important and fighting colonial wars and things like that and fighting the First World War is all going to be important. But really, it's a game about population groups, managing different segments of your population, managing your economy, making sure that you're meeting your people's needs, dealing with government reforms. You know, this is the era where monarchies are on the way out. Democracies are on the way in. And, you know, you're, you're seeing a shift from um, landowners to uh, to merchants and industrialists. Uh, and so it's a really fundamental shift. You have a ton of huge historical events, be it the revolutions of 1848, the unification of, of Prussia conquering and, and unifying Germany as a single country. It is 
one of the most consequential periods in world history. And so um, I played a lot of Victoria one, a little bit less of Victoria two, uh, but it's a game that, you know, I know people used to like love to micromanage the economy because there was so much there and you'd build factories and then factories would generate capitalists and capitalists, you know, would, would go on to build more of their own private factories. And you kind of get that, that chain rolling and that, that capitalism and, and, you know, imperialism chain rolling, and, uh, and then it would generate revenue via taxes and other things like that for your government, which you could then pour into building dreadnoughts or warships and, you know, building out uh, your military to subjugate your, your rivals. And so I think of any period in history, this is one of the most interesting because it's really just unadulterated imperialism throughout the world as Europe basically colonized the entire world outside of the Americas um, and still had very strong influence in the Americas. You know, you see the rise of the United States to a global superpower, but also including the American Civil War in that period of time. And uh, and it really shaped the world that we live in today. And I think it's a, an interesting period. I love myself some dreadnoughts. I love myself some rapid technological development. And so it's it's a period that is is very interesting. And so I'm excited about Victoria 3. I've heard some trepidation about, you know, some of the things they're abstracting in terms of, you know, making militaries much more hands off. So it's not maybe a map painter in the same way that some previous Paradox games are. Um, seems like they're leaning very heavily into the social side of things, which I've heard some people express some some reservations about. But like this era was was about social transformation. You know, the revolutions in Europe in 1848, the Russian Revolution, the, the German uh, sort of revolution at the end of World War One, and then, and then you know, the run-up in, in uh, Weimar, Germany, and leading into, into World War II. Like, this is an era of, era of political upheaval. This is an era where you have the French communes uh, rise to power briefly. The era where Napoleon uh, III takes over and rules France to then be overthrown uh, himself during the Franco-Prussian War. Um, the Habsburg succession crisis leading into that. Uh, this is this is just an era where there is a ton of social transformation and industrialization leads to a lot of political strife. And so, you know, while maybe some some purists of sort of the paradox history are a little bit um, a little bit concerned that maybe it's not as war gamey as they would like. I'm really curious to see how this plays out because CK3 was the last big paradox game. Uh, and the last one that I played a ton of, and I think they hit it out of the park from the start because they knew what they wanted to do. They knew there was a story that they wanted to tell and they wanted to have a particular view of how to approach that. And it wasn't like all military management, right? CK is about family management. Um, but then again, the game that came out before that was Imperador and that, that did not get received terribly well. And so, um, you know, there's been a little bit of a spotty track record, at least based on reception of Paradox games. Um, but I'm, I'm excited and I'm curious to see what comes of it. And I think you can definitely do this game and this era, right. By focusing heavily on social stuff, as long as the military isn't like non-existent. And so I guess we'll see how they strike that balance, but that's definitely my most anticipated game of the year. Assuming it'll come out this year. I, I don't know when, uh, presumably it would be toward the back half of the year, but they did announce it you know, I think over six months ago. So I'm, I'm expecting it to come out this year, although they haven't announced a date yet. With that being said, that's going to do it for my top five strategy games of 2022. Let me know if you think I left anything out that you want to uh, see included in that list and uh, stay tuned for my top five most anticipated war games of 2022, where we delve into the, you know, combat side of things, or in the case of flight sims that involve bombing people. That being said, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please leave your thoughts down below. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching. And as always, until next time, I'm out. Bye-bye.